General of the United Nations Office at Geneva. It's a pleasure to have you here and an honor. And I'd like also to introduce my co-interviewers. Uh, we'll start with Anna, Anastabra Kopulu, and Dr. Tsimbobu of the National Library of Greece. Um, Mr. Miller will be um, formulating a topic, a very interesting topic, Conflicts, Challenges, Cooperation and Solutions, the UN in the 21st Century. Um, but before we, we discuss the 21st century, I, I'd like to say, to ask you to tell us a little bit about the Cold War and its lingering after effects um, after the, the demise of the Soviet Empire. And, and are we still in a, a polarized world? Um, I mean, as a multi, multi polar Bipolarized world, you mean the bipolar? Of course, yes. we're not, but we're not. But let me just start with the Cold War. I think you know the, the, the euphoria of the 90s uh, has dissipated. The Cold War of that time is over. Uh, some people, including my own boss, the Secretary General, uh, is of the opinion that we are in a Cold War-like situation now. Back, back of the back of the benches in many cases. We're also back with a big uh, difference, um, as we were discussing before. Um, the last Cold War had a number of failsafes. Uh, there were mechanisms that were in place that ensured that we didn't completely get off the rails uh, in, in any kind of situation. And uh, those, um, uh, those fail-safes and back channel talks and mechanisms don't seem to be there. And if they're there, they're very weak. And that is worrisome. It is worrisome at a time when uh, we are um, not just in a cold war, but we are in a war in a situation where trust has dissipated to a great extent, uh, where um, the world has fragmented, where Many states uh, and individuals and non-state actors are walking away from the rules that we so painstakingly put in place for the past 70 years, are walking away from international law, are walking away from the values that have governed the way that we, um, we run our planet. Um, and that's clearly a problem in itself, but it's even more of a problem at a time when we are facing some major existential problems, um, first among which is climate change, that needs to be tackled. And and if we agree that we're never going to tackle the climate change, then we can practically stop the conversation now because all the rest of the way it won't matter. Um, so it is, um, it is a problem. And it is also a problem when you put up, look at all this, um, which uh, where well, we also are in a transitional uh, moment in history in governance terms where we're moving away from a, a, a purely state-centric uh, system at all levels, uh, both international, regional, national, Local to a much more polycentric or multi stakeholder. We haven't quite found a word yet to describe it. And um, the old system is still there on the defensive, asymmetrically as well. The new system is not defined yet, really. Um, it's certainly not legitimized yet. And um, uh, in any situation where you are between two chairs, nonsense happens. And this is what we're living right now. So, um, uh, to, then to come to your second question, which is about the, uh, um, the, the, the multipolar uh, against the bipolar, I think clearly um, we are no longer in a bipolar situation. Um, the, 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 the system that was finely balanced during the Cold War as well between two superpowers um, is no longer in place. We have many different actors today um, that uh, claim a seat at the table. Um, we also have uh, other actors that are lesser size, if you want, um, who also take decisions and, and influence, uh, influence the affairs of the, of the planet. Uh, we have non-state actors of all different kinds. We have a business community that also has a legitimate reason to be around the decision-making table. It's a very different kind of uh, landscape we are operating in right now. And it's very fluid. The geopolitical and geostrategic situation is changing every two minutes. Um, it's very interesting, but it's uh, also at times but you you remain hopeful, I, I, I gather from the tenor of your your uh, synopsis here. I'm an optimist you're, you're not by optimist. trade and by birth. Yes, I think <laughs> diplomats have to be optimists. Yeah, if you work in my business, you um, you have to. Yes. 
But it's not only because of that, because, uh, you know, uh, and this is also part of what I'm going to be saying in, in my, my, my lecture later on. Um, there is a, a number of very positive things that are happening um, and that show that there are solutions. Um, two and a half years ago, the world gave itself a whole series of new policy frameworks, uh, quite counterintuitively for many. Um, the Paris Agreement on Climate, uh, the, the, uh, the 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development, what we call the SDGs, uh, an agreement on financing for development, an agreement on the diminution of the risks of catastrophes, and uh, later on also a, a global agreement on how we're going to um, manage cities, a very important element as well. All these put together uh, with the Sustainable Development Goals as the, the chapeau, if you want, have really become our global roadmap to an extent that we actually never had before. And which is pushing, first of all, a very uh, mindset change in how we are to deal with the affairs of our planet, uh, but also in a very much faster way than I've ever seen before also um, in how we work, uh, well, how we, we see much greater collaboration, much greater um, integration of efforts, much greater understanding that uh, we're all in it together unless there is a much more collaborative effort, um, we're simply not going to make it. Um, and that is at all levels of society. It's not just the sort of formal states, you know, the built society, the UN system or the international system or states themselves. It's the business community, it's the NGO community, it's the society at large, it's the academic community. Um, it's particularly the young people. Um, and that gives a lot of hope uh, because I am, I am certainly um, where, I, where I'm uh, situated in Geneva, which is really the operational hub of the international system, more so than any other place on the planet. Um, we are, I'm seeing uh, 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 new ways and, and new collaborative genes being developed um, that I've never seen before, which, is, which gives you hope. So there is hope. There's also hope. Yeah. What a, a, a more existential uh, source of hope is the fact that uh, we human beings have a very, very strong survival gene. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, the unfortunate part of that is that we usually have to have a knife at our throats before it kind of kicks in, but it's there. And, uh, and we see it time and time again that uh, when we're really uh, under the gun, then we find solutions. And uh, I see that happening as well. So would you say that the role of the UN in this very fragmented world is even more important? It's the, yes. the right agent of it is even more important. Yes, change, yeah. yes it's, uh, it's, it's even more important. No, I wouldn't say the prime agent because that is no longer the case. But it is a, a catalyst, and it's particularly um, the neutral table around which all of these actors can sit together and agree um, on a whole series of issues. Um, um, I, yeah, well, let's take one that is a pressing part of us, which is the digital age, and the fact that. Um, needs to be done better, the cyber security needs to be taken care of better, artificial intelligence needs to be dealt with really urgently, both in terms of how we're governing it and, 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 and overseeing it, and how we're going to inject some ethics into the, the use. And uh, because of the very diffuse, different um, uh, actors that, are, that, are, that have legitimate reasons and very clear reasons also to want to be part of the discussion, um, and in very often contradictory agendas, we have to have a neutral table, and that is what we can provide and what we are in the process of trying to, to offer. Also because more and more of these actors, particularly in the, in the, uh, um, the technological aspect of it, Silicon Valley and others, are asking for more and more because they realize that you know, they're very good at the technical stuff, but they're really not good at, uh, at the government stuff. And that is something that we have a lot of experience. So, um, so these are the kind of things that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, so everybody flocks to you in a sense, and they want should to not everybody ah, <laughs> should, uh, but we are offering ourselves for that. I mean, this is what we were created for. This is what the UN was created for back seventy two years ago now, and um, uh, and I think that it, more and more people understand that. Uh, that um, uh, let me put it in a different way: if we closed it down today, it would have to be reinvented tomorrow. A similar level. I think that also um, the, uh, one of the things that I like to, to remind uh, people of is that um, if you look at the human race as it is today, we have never been as well off as we are today 
in Apple history. <coughs> a large, a large uh, part of the reason for that is the international structures of which we have to say, well, we are live longer, we live better, we're better educated, and every human indicator that you care to look at in very statistical terms, we are much better off than we've ever been. If we're not careful um, and don't get our governance structures right, again, we stand to lose that. And that would be pretty catastrophic because everybody's life, including us four, us five, would be a lot worse off if that system collapses. So yes, there's hope. But it is, it takes work. What would you say is, is the UN's biggest success or what has been the greatest success? I just mentioned it. Probably. Do, you, do you think that's just well, that is one of them, but there, and it's a whole string of successes. I mean, if you go back in history and you go back to the 60s and 70s and you look at the whole process of decolonization, yes. it's huge success. Right? Mm -hmm. if, you look at, um, if, you, if you look at today, uh, if you look at what human rights is today, and you just look back 20 years, 25 years, mm -hmm. um, you couldn't mention the words human rights in the Security Council 20 years ago, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. And in a very short period of time, um, the whole essence of human rights has become central to everything that we do. It's under stress, I think, right now. Um, and it will be under stress in different times of history, but the fact is that this has become a fundamental part of, our, of the, the, the common values of humanity. Um, that is you know, something that the, the then Secretary General put in and pushed very hard. I think that the, the fact that we have eradicated several illnesses, um, there's there are plenty of examples. Yeah. One of the things that is interesting, in, uh, uh, interesting and, and a little frustrating at times is that uh, when you ask, or when you talk about the UN, and when you ask you know, most people on this planet about the UN, um, the immediate thing that comes to their mind is the Security Council that doesn't function. Right. It's a few wars that we can't make, like Syria. It's a couple of pandemics that we're still getting around to. It's some uh, unacceptable behavior by a few uh, peacekeepers. And it much stops there, stops there. And completely forgetting the rest of the, I usually use the image of an iceberg. The, the very top, the 10% is what we see and what the press writes about. But the real stuff is 90% underwater, which is uh, uh, all the extraordinary things that happen in our everyday lives. Uh, Syria, uh, a lot more people would have died by now if it wasn't for the humanitarian assistance. The, Educational assistance, the health assistance, uh, and all of the all of the operational agencies who are, uh, were there and have helped millions and millions of people. People tend to forget about that. Um, norms, uh, that, uh, norms and, uh, and standards that have been, that govern everything that we do in our daily lives, but that we take for granted and never really uh, um, give uh, ownership for. But uh, all of these things would uh, make our lives a lot more difficult than they are today. So I think that. I think that you know, when, I, when I started this job, I realized that uh, we, were not, we had not been for many, many decades very good <coughs> at the narrative of what we do, explain to people what is the relevance and the impact of what the system does in their personal lives. So I sat down with my colleague and said, look, we need to completely change the way we talk about things. I want you to come up with three words to describe everything that we do. And we settled on three words, which is peace, rights, and well -being. That's what we do. And that's the, people understand that because that touches them in their daily life. And that's pretty much um, peace, rights, and what we do. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Yes. What about uh, cultural heritage? <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. As it happens, I am uh, in the process now, we are in the process of, uh, of uh, restoring the Palais des Nations, which is, is extraordinary. Art Deco building that was built from 1928 to 1936 that housed the League of Nations and then was removed here. And we're restoring it, um, and I'm, uh, we are restoring it with a very keen eye on the, on the historical uh, legacy that we're leaving and not messing about with it. Cultural heritage is an incredibly important aspect of, uh, of our lives and uh, of uh, making sure that as we move forward and look into the future, we don't forget the past, yes. which is an important, incredibly important, central um, um, tool for making sure we don't uh, make the same mistakes that we, that we often do. Um, I think that uh, we're doing a lot, for example, um, at, um, at, in my workplace on 
what I call cultural diplomacy, where we encourage um, all kinds of cultures to come and show what they're about through exhibitions, through music, through through readings, through you know, all, all kinds of ways. And this most people don't quite realize the incredible impact um, that culture has on our uh, on, the, on the perception we have about this. So to put it in some terms, if I am going to negotiate with you tomorrow and I happen to see a uh, art exhibit and listen to some music from your country, the afternoon before, my impression of you as a negotiator would be a very different one mm -hmm. than if I hadn't. And this is very, but this is a kind of a subliminal part of, of, of diplomacy, of trying, of, of, the, of, the, of, of, of being that table around which everybody can sit and talk in a way where we can actually get to some solutions um, in a peaceful way. So to me, it's incredibly important. Culture is a very much of a cornerstone of what we do. Okay. Take a brief. It's the conflict between the 
get your powers, or is the local, that is spread competence, the, which will tell the statistics? Yeah. Well, the greatest threat, frankly, is none of these. The greatest threat to us today is the climate change. By the climate. It's the, it's the biggest threat that we face. Okay. I had a conversation a few days ago with the head of the World Meteorological Organization. It was scary. I mean, scary doesn't even start to cover it. Um, and unless we do something really fast, we are going to be, we have already passed some tipping points, but we will be very, in the next ten, two or three decades, we will come to a tipping point where then we are going to be in deep trouble as a time. And then all the rest doesn't make any meaning. Now, but it comes back to what you, another element that you were talking about. Um, I think that <clears throat> one of the problems that we're facing today particularly in this time where I say that we are in a, in a transition phase in government structures, where we're seeing um, the role of the state diminish, the central state diminish. Um, that also means that the quality of the leadership that we're getting has diminished. I think we can all agree on that. And, and we're generalizing. Mm -hmm. What is happening now is that the real interesting politicians and leaders are mayors of cities, which is where the, the, the real stuff is going to happen. We are already, by 2050, 75% of the whole population of the world is going to be in cities. If you go to Latin America today, it's so close to 64% already. And this completely is changing the way that we, we, we take care of our citizens, provide services, agriculture, education, health, and the whole part of it. Um, so the, the big structural problem we have that is very much impacting our ability to get to where we need to go is that you have a tension and a growing gap between short-term political systems and the long-term needs of the solutions we need to apply to the problems we have to do. So most politicians today are simply not able to or willing to take decisions that will have an impact 15 years later. They want decisions that they can see right now. Next month. And next month, maybe next year. Yes. Because they need to get re-elected. That's, that's no, next generation. That's globally the case. That's globally the case. That's globally the case. And it's a huge structural problem. I mean, seriously. Yes. And, uh, this is, comes back to your question about the, the, the utility of the UN. Mm -hmm. Because that's precisely one of the big uh, the, 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 the strengths of a system that was created and has accumulated an extraordinary amount of expertise, knowledge, and human capital. That can provide that <coughs> while all of this nonsense is sorted out. Um, so, uh, so, you know, we, it's a... Uh, now, you can't pinpoint one culprit. You can't find one <coughs> reason uh, that is the problem. And therefore, you cannot find one thing that is going to be the solution. And this is exactly what the Sustainable Development Goals are about, these ones here. Because they have, the way they were devised and the way they're understood and the way people have appropriated them, um, is they are indivisible and interconnected. So you can't talk about one thing, you can't talk about health without talking about education, talking about climate, talking about all of the other issues. Um, and they, uh, the, the, there are three very basic principles that govern uh, their implementation. One is that they're indivisible and integrally related. Two is that they leave no one behind. We cannot leave anyone behind. They apply to everybody. The solutions will touch everybody. <coughs> it's everybody's responsibility. It's not something that you leave to your government and you call every Christmas to see how they're doing. We are all responsible for making sure that they have. Those are the big changes in, in, in sort of existential changes, if you want, in the understanding and in the crafting of those agreements. Uh, it, quite a, a miracle that you know, 193 countries actually signed off on them. They are not <coughs> voluntary, they are voluntary, but the fact is that it's happening in a way that we have never seen before. It's really quite something. And what about the role of the United States? The role of the United States is an interesting one. It's a, and I say that not in a facetious way, um, because what you're looking at there is exactly what I was referring to in terms of the, the change in, in governance. Mm -hmm. um, you have a situation where the president um, takes a decision to withdraw his country from uh, the climate agreement. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds later, the rest of the country says, ah, <coughs> we are going to continue. So you had governors, you had, the, you had mayors, you had citizens, you had major businesses. And you have Mr. Bloomberg, who is paying the, um, the, the, the fee that the United States were paying before to the climate change secretary. He pays out of his own pocket for the whole country. 
So there's a completely different mindset, as I said, where and the, the, exactly the same thing happened on migration. Um, most of Americans don't agree with what uh, the nonsense that, that they're doing there. The same thing is happening in other countries in Hungary and Poland. So the, 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 the increasing role of civil society in the affairs of the of the, their affairs um, is changing the equation uh, very quickly now. And uh, where it's going to go, who knows, but it's part of that transition that we have moved to a multi-stakeholder kind of governance. There are many examples at lower levels, not at global levels, of uh, very incredibly successful multi-stakeholder governance structures, particularly in the health sector and in the education sector. Um, for example, there are two major organizations, and one is called Gavi the other called Global Fund, that does pretty much all the vaccinations of kids, tens of millions of kids every year, people every year. And because it has been a multi-stakeholder government structure, they have been incredibly effective. Not only in actually doing the stuff, but also in getting the, uh, the resources to do it. So for example, uh, two years ago, the Global Fund, uh, they, every two years they have what they call their replenishment, which they go out and get money so that they can do their stuff. In one week, they collected $13 billion. There is no other organization that has ever done that before. Billion. Billion. Yeah. 13 billion. And the only reason why they were able to do that is because they were effective. And one of the reasons why they're effective is because they have this very uh, multi-stakeholder government structure. And also because they have good people. But it's an interesting example, and we're now trying to see how we can scale that up <coughs> to draw some of the lessons that are needed to, to start looking at different governance models that are beginning to... It happens organically. The problem is that organically is not fast enough. The world is changing too fast for, for just letting things uh, trundle along. Or we need to relax it. Did I answer you? Yes, of course. Definitely. Um, this isn't a question, it's just a statement. We, we have a lot of refugees in Greece. Yes. I'm aware of some less than many others. Less than many others. But what is your take on, on refugees in general? Like, is it, well, is um, it a, a symptom or is it a. Yes, of course, it's a symptom, but it's a symptom of many things. It's not just a symptom of war, it's also a symptom of mismanagement. It's a symptom of lack of prevention. It's a symptom of, uh, of uh, yes, lack of prevention, but in a broader sense. Mm -hmm. I started my career working with refugees. Um, and um, looking at what has happened in Europe over the past several years, um, I was completely bemused the fact that uh, Back in the late 70s, early 80s, we were in pretty much the same situation in the Southeast Asia. We had people fleeing by boat, getting uh, attacked on the high seas by pirates, dying by the hundreds and not the thousands. We had countries closing their doors and their borders. Um, and somehow the world got together and actually solved the problem. It took a few years, but uh, we resettled somewhere between two and three million people around the world in a way that was acceptable to all. We stopped the death and uh, destruction uh, on the high seas, um, and you know people got around the table again, our table, and agreed on something called a comprehensive plan of action. <coughs> and I never quite understood why um, we did not take out some pages of that uh, to deal with the things here in Europe. Of course, it's not the same in terms of the ethnicities of the, of the groups, of it. and of course the, the fact that many were Muslims and uh, many. They came into Europe instead of coming into Asia, and all of these differences um, being equal, um, you know, I think that we could have done a lot better. My big problem is uh, the following. If you look at the numbers, let me just say that again. If you look at the numbers of people who have fed into Europe, we're talking about a very small number of people compared to the overall population. Mm -hmm. There's something like 0.2%. We should be able to deal with that. The fact is that we succumbed to um, a hateful narrative, um, an anti-Muslim narrative, an anti-migration narrative, in spite also of the fact that uh, if you look at, a, um, at it from an economic point of view, in an aging Europe, we need workers to come from, we need migrants. Um, uh, Germany, uh, just on its own, will need 400,000 a year migrants just to keep the economy ticking along at the rate where it is now. Um, and every single country in Europe, Italy amongst them, uh, particularly because they are, um, they have one of the lowest birth rates and replacement rates. Um, so, 
I mean, there are some, uh, some, some disconnects and there's some really a lack of leadership um, that succumbed to the lowest common denominator narratives, um, uh, and which was, uh, I find, upset, not accepted. So that's one thing. I think that uh, the, the, the system has kicked in. Uh, High Commission for Refugees, IOM, World Food Program, UNICEF, all of these organizations have done an amazing piece of work, both inside um, Syria, for example, but also in other places where that are refugee producing. Um, I think for the world, if we had had the right kind of leadership and had applied our considerable resources in a more targeted way, we could have prevented a lot of this stuff. I'm personally convinced that if we had um, been smarter at addressing the root causes of what would become a problem in places like Syria, we wouldn't even have had a war. Mm -hmm. Same in Central African Republic, same in Mali, same in many other places that are previous that years have made. The big problem is what is coming. It's not this problem. This problem is small potatoes uh, compared to uh, what we may be facing in the next decades. And again, I come back to climate. Um, climate induced refugees and migrants. Um, if we're not careful, I'm going to be numbering in the tens and not hundreds of thousands of people on the move in a, in a not too distant future. And uh, we have not the structures, neither legal, political, operational, logistical, are not in place. And not to speak of a much more robust um, international solidarity that needs to be rebuilt in order for the, the world, the planet, to deal with what is going to be a major problem. A lot of these people are going to be moving and moving around in the regions where they, but still, these will pepper will be tough. Um, and that's one thing. Look at demographics. Um, within the next few decades, Africa will double its population. We'll have around 4 billion people. In a, in, a, in a context where they're, right now at least, if we extrapolate from the situation that we're in now, <coughs> we're under development, lack of education, lack of jobs, um, unemployment that are stratospheric and they if you look at some countries like Uganda, or, uh, where the average age is 15 years old, 16 years old. Um, so you can just make the math. Uh, so all it takes is 1% of 4 billion to suddenly decide it needs to move. And we have a problem, much bigger than what we have right now. So we need to rethink a little bit how we do our business also, um, in as I said, in terms of prevention. That's very much at the heart of what we're trying to do now and trying to re re restructure the system in a way that will make sense. That will be more, uh, more efficient. I come back to the sustainable development goals because if we manage to implement them, and most of the problems I'm talking about, including climate, uh, we will maybe not have solved completely, but certainly have mitigated to the point where some of these kind of uh, catastrophic scenarios that I'm talking about may not happen. But we are in a hurry. We're in a hurry. <laughs> no, we're not. Like, yes. I, mean, I haven't even started talking about access to water, access to food. Etc., which also is a very uh, clear um, uh, catalyst for, 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 for crisis and for war. Some of the wars that we have faced already, the Darfur, for example, is very clearly a water related conflict uh, for access to, to resources. And we will see that more and more. Uh, the Nile is in a very unhealthy state. If that goes back, and it will if, we don't, if they're not careful, then you have uh, you know, Egypt, Sudan. Ethiopia, all of these countries that, uh, that, uh, that uh, rely on the, line, the Nile for their survival. And you look at uh, in the Middle East, the Euphrates and the Tigris, it's completely, totally polluted. Um, it's uh, unfit for human consumption, most of it. And uh, uh, it, uh, it's also, unless we start managing it much better, going to be uh, uh, the, 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 the reason for some really serious conflagrations. Nothing. Did I depress you completely? Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, because you mentioned peace, rights, and well-being. That's it. And, and uh, thank you very much. We, we all look forward to your talk this, this evening. And, and thank you for hosting us so, once again. Thank you. It's an honor and pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you for bringing me back. Thank, thank you for coming. <laughs> Σήμερα να φωτοξενεί αυτή την εκδήλωση 
Δεν δε θέλω να σας κουράσω. Έχουμε έναν άξιο μερική και επειδή προηγήθηκε μια σύντομη συνέντευξη που μας ανέτρεψε τουλάχιστον εμένα πράγματα που ήρθε στο μυαλό μου, θα ήθελα να μπείτε στη βάση μου και εσείς, στη δοκιμασία και εσείς. Θα καλέσω αμέσω τον ε, Διευθυντή του Κέντρου Ελληνικών Σπουδών, τον κύριο Γιάννη Πετρόπουλο, καθηγητή Γιάννη Πετρόπουλο, καθηγητή Πληρολογία του Δημοτικού Πανεπιστήμιου Μεθαρική, να πάρει το βήμα και να συνεχίσει την συνάντηση. Ε, λείπει κόσμο, ελπίζω όλοι αυτοί να είναι στα μουσεία και όχι σε άλλου χώρου, αλλά θα προσπαθήσουμε με την ποιότητα των δεδομένων του κ. Μίλερ να καλύψουμε το κενό τη αριθμό. Κύριε Πετρόπουλη, καλύτε, έχει το λόγο. Ευχαριστώ. Ευχαριστώ. Ευχαριστώ κύριε Γιάννη και Διευθυντά. Ε, παρόλο, ε, κυρίες και κύριοι, που ο μιλητής μιλάει άπτες στα ελληνικά και θα μπορούσε να δώσει την ομιλία του στα ελληνικά, θα μιλήσει στα αγγλικά. Ε, αρχικά σκεφτήκαμε προς χάρη των μελών του ακροατηρίου τα οποία δεν γνωρίζουν την ελληνική. Γι' αυτό τον λόγο θα προτιμήσω και εγώ να μιλήσω στα αγγλικά. Director General of the United Nations Office at Geneva, Ambassadors, Director General of the National Library of Greece, Executive Director of the Fulbright Foundation in Greece, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Center for Hellenic Studies, I would like to welcome all of you to this lecture, the second to last in the Center, in the Center's series. I would like also to thank the Director General of the National Library of Greece for hosting this event. The magnificent National Library is the most fitting venue for the activities of the CHS in Washington, D.C., our mother institution, clustered around a library from the day the center opened its doors in 1961. Several private collections of books and offerings make up, made up the first library of the center. One of these belonged to the German Hellenist Werner Jäger, who died only a few days before the center received its first six junior fellows, five men and a woman. Fleeing the Nazis, Jaeger and his half-Jewish wife emigrated to the United States in 1936. In fact, they emigrated along with his books. And in the United States, he became a professor, first at the University of Chicago and then at Harvard devoting some 40 years of his life to Greek philosophy and literature, including the works of the Cappadocian Fathers, Jaeger was convinced that the quintessence of humanism was to be found in ancient Greece. Only by reviving Greek studies could a new humanism be born. This too was the conviction of Paul Mellon and Marie Beale, co-founders of the Centre, Marie Beale's husband, incidentally, had served as a diplomat in the United States State Department during the 1922 Smyrna disaster. And she was attuned not only to the culture of the ancients, but also to the suffering of the modern Greeks. I am sure that were the founders of the CHS alive today, both would be pleased to know that the center has established a presence in Greece, which is fast becoming a robust counterpart to the center in Washington. Paul Mellon, who had studied ancient Greek history at the University of Cambridge, endowed the center in Washington in the belief that a research institution, and I quote, a research institution concerned mainly with the civilization of ancient Greece will spread humanistic ideals in American life and beyond, end of quote. To mark the 10th anniversary of the formal inauguration of the Center for Hellenic Studies in Greece. This year's lecture series takes its cue from Mellon's vision of consolidating human-centered values. That is why the overarching theme of our talks since December has been leadership and humanism. 
Researchers at the Center in Washington have, over the decades, been a veritable United Nations of talented women and men, representing more than 35 countries. And they still use Jaeger's physical library while enjoying direct access to the digital and other resources of Harvard mm. Library, the largest private library in the United States. In similar fashion, students and specialists of all ages who come to the center in Napoleon also have access gratis to the unparalleled digital resources of Harvard University. Since 2011, more than 5,000 students and instructors have taken the hour and a half introductory class offered at the center in the use of educational digital resources and have consulted Harvard Library online. The center's collaboration with the National Library of Greece began in 2015. Since then, with the support and through the coordination of the CHS, Dr. Tsimboglu and several of his colleagues have visited the center in Washington and exchanged ideas with colleagues, not only at the center, but also at the Library of Congress, the Library of the University of Virginia, and Harvard's Widener Library. The CHS in Washington, in concert with the University of Leipzig, has digitized a formidable array of Greek texts from the first millennium of the Greek language and is now moving into the second millennium. The project is intended for a global uh, public and will offer free access to texts in Greece, in Greek, across the ages. The second thousand years of Greek is an area in which the center and the National Library of, of Greece will soon be embarking on further collaboration. Now, we are, ladies and gentlemen, quite near to the Bay of Phaleron. Here, in September 490 BC, the navy of the Persian king Darius dropped anchor after being defeated at Marathon some 14 hours earlier. The Persians halted off the coast, poised to launch another invasion on Greek soil. Spotting them, the Athenians rushed from what is now Neasmirni to the shore of Phaleron to demonstrate their resolve. The Persian armada promptly headed for Asia. Had the Athenians not had good leaders, both military and political, they could not have defeated the Persians either at Marathon or 10 years later at Salamis. Had the Greeks been vanquished, ancient Greece would have been a grim place indeed. The Athenians would not have become the intellectual and cultural leaders they were for many, many centuries. Greek humanist values would probably never have flourished. The history of mankind has been full of invasions and intermittent peace and humanitarian crisis. And this brings me to this evening's speaker, the Director General of the United Nations at Geneva, a diplomat who has worked for decades to preserve peace and to relieve human suffering in far off places. Mr. Michael Muller has kindly taken time out of his schedule to give this talk, and all of us here are most thankful. A few words then about our speaker. Michael Muller is the 12th Director General of the United Nations Office at Geneva. He has over 38 years of experience as an international civil servant in the United Nations. He began his career in 1979 with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and worked for the United Nations in various capacities in New York, Mexico, Iran, uh, Haiti, Cyprus, and Geneva. In 1995 through 97, he served as political senior political advisor to the general sec to the general director general of the of UN Geneva. Between 1997 and 2001. He was head of the office of the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs at United Nations Headquarters. Between 2001 and 2006, he was Director for Political, Peacekeeping, and Humanitarian Affairs in the office of the Secretary General, while serving at the same time as Deputy Chef de Cabinet of the Secretary General 
for the last two years of that period. Mr. Miller also served as the Secretary General's Special Representative for Cyprus from 2006 to 2008 and was the Executive Director of the Kofi Annan Foundation from 2008 to 2011. In recognition of his efforts to deepen public understanding of the vital role of the United Nations and its partners in Geneva, Mr. Müller received a series of prizes from the city of Geneva, the Union Suisse, the Attaché de Presse, and most recently, the Fondation pour Genève. Born in 1952 in Copenhagen, Mr. Müller earned a master's degree in international relations from Johns Hopkins University and a bachelor's degree in international relations from the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. So I'd like to call to the floor our speaker. Um, Mr. Miller's topic is Conflicts, Challenges, Cooperation and Solutions, the United Nations in the 21st Century. just a matter of uh, pleasant memories and a pleasant present, but it also every time reminds me of um, the extraordinary things that we owe to this country, the very foundation of our political ideals, our sense of society, even the way we tell a story, or as the French author Raymond Queneau once put it, every great work of literature is either the Iliad or the Odyssey. It was in um, Athens that Aristotle recognized the zone politicum, the human being as a social and political being. And it is only within the community of the polis, he taught us, that human life can flourish. It may come into being for the sake of living, he said, but it remains in existence for the sake of living well. But across the millennia that followed, the nature of how this polis should be constructed who should hold power and how, was perennially contested. In fact, the implicit self-evidence with which we in recent times treat a democracy as a natural order within a state and the liberal rule-based system between states at times today seem almost naive. The last couple of years have shaken off this complacency. We are forced to acknowledge that fundamental questions about the way our world is governed have been thrown wide open once again. This crisis obviously did not emerge out of a vacuum, and yet it feels recent. It, feels, it felt unthinkable in the 1990s, at the apex of euphoria just after the Iron Curtain came down. And even in 2011, as the first buds of the Arab Spring blossomed, history seemed to have but one direction. And today, People ask whether democracy is viable. Powerful actors on the world stage propagate the motto, yes to growth and security, no to freedom and democracy. A new fascination for authoritarianism has penetrated our discourse. As I said, none of this, none of this emerged out of a vacuum. To explore where it came from, and crucially, what we can do about it, um, let me propose three terms and interrogate them in turn. There are polarization, diffusion, and disruption. Let's start with polarization. This one is perhaps the easiest to recognize. Listen to a political debate today, and chances are you will hear it instantly. It's reminiscent of what Hannah Arendt wrote of the 1920s and 1930s. Any statement of fact becomes a, st a question of motive. Debates are decided by allegiance, not arguments. The very modus operandi of populists the world over depends on polarization, on us versus them. The people against the establishment, the local versus the immigrants, and similar false dichotomies. But we also witness structural polarization. 
Think about how big cities are booming, but opportunities are disappearing in many rural areas. Young people in particular are leaving for the city despite of rising rents and strained infrastructure, searching for stable employment they too often cannot find, and facing growing despair. Think about how bonuses and salaries in the global financial industry reach dizzying heights and benefit only a few, while the vast majority see income stagnate. Think about how the CEO of a company now makes more money in a single day than a typical worker does in an entire year and in some cases an entire lifetime. 82% of the wealth generated last year went to the world's richest 1%, according to a new Oxfam report. The world created new billionaires at a rate of one every two days. The world created uh, nine-tenths of them, sorry, uh, were men, by the way. This huge increase among the, f the one percent could actually have ended extreme poverty on our planet seven times over. But instead, the nearly four billion people who make up the poorest half of the world saw no increase in their wealth. Entire regions and countries are failing to catch up to the waves of progress left behind in what we could call the rust belts of our world. There is an economic polarization where some people, global elites, wealthy corporations, are seemingly living by a different set of rules, avoiding taxes and manipulating loopholes, while ordinary citizens feel that bank may be too big to fail, but I am too small to matter. Deepening polarization in our political debate and rampant inequality in our economic affairs is creating a dangerous seedbed for discontent. It stretches the fabric of society to the breaking point. It undermines trust in the institutions that are supposed to govern our societies. And speaking about the institutions that govern our society brings me to the second development that drives this sense of instability, and that is diffusion. We are witnessing a dramatic diffusion of power. What used to be a bipolar world with controlled confrontation between two superpowers has metamorphosed into something much more diffuse. Internationally, mid-level powers act increasingly autonom autonomously from the big powers. Domestically, the state's monopoly of power is challenged by non-state actors. Cyberspace is, mo is mostly privately owned and operated by huge corporations. And even within governments, mayors can at times be as influential in making policy as prime ministers or presidents. And thanks to technology, people have immediate access to information equipping them with the tools to join the public debate and hold their governments accountable. So the impact of this can of course be good, such as when it empowers citizens to make their voice heard in the decision-making process. The impact can also be bad, such as when states lose effective control over their territory and protracted conflicts become more complicated than three-dimensional chess. In either case, the new polycentric system is most fluid and unstable than the balance of power that preceded it. Many actors, other than governments today, have the means to act on global scale, and some of it is rooted in the liberalization that began in the 1970s, which essentially marked a retreat of public actors, like governments, relative to private entities, like big corporations. But equally critical was the technological transformation that has shrunk the world by compressing time and space. And speaking about technological transformation brings me to the third term I introduced before, that of disruption. Technology has disrupted every dimension of our life on a scale that is nothing short of breathtaking. Again, it has done so, both for the good and for the bad. The technology that delivers the entirety of human knowledge to a child in a remote village on a single handheld device is undoubtedly good. But the same technology also equips some governments and corporations with the means for surveillance of almost anyone, anywhere, anytime. And all indications are that we are on the verge of much greater disruptions. Artificial intelligence, to quote the CEO of Google, will be as profound for humanity's progress as electricity or fire. But what happens when machines are smart enough to become workers in other words, when capital becomes labor. The McKinney Global Institute has calculated that 375 million people, 
that's 14% of the global workforce, could have their jobs automated away by 2030. Indeed, it is statistics like this one that lead many to look warily into the future. And there is no shortage of gloomy predictions and no shortage of existential threats to justify them. First among those threats is climate change. To make it tangible, think about what will happen to the planet in just the one hour we are spending together tonight. In that one hour, according to data from the World Bank and the World Wildlife Fund, 4 million tons of carbon dioxide will be emitted. 1,500 hectares of forest will be cut and three species will go extinct. And during this hour, the pollution that already exists in our atmosphere will trap as much heat as would be released by detonating over 16,600 Hiroshima sizes atomic bombs. All of this just in one hour. And the impact of all this is clear and undeniable as the latest report from my colleagues in the World Meteorological Organizations have confirmed. 17 of the hottest years ever measured have been since 2001. The hottest of all were the last three years. Climate change threatens everyone, everywhere, and it requires urgent collective action. And instead, our society is polarized, authorities, authority is diffuse, and we are transfixed as established ways of working and living are disrupted. And all of this combines to produce an overarching sense of disquiet, gloom and pessimism. And this is borne out by the data, interesting data by the way. A recent study showed that just 36% of all 20 to 25 year olds, some of you are in this room, in the developed world, the, industrial, uh, the industrialized countries of Europe and North America believe that the future will look brighter for them. But here comes the twist. The same survey asked the young generation in the developing world across Asia, Africa, and Latin America where they looked optimistically, uh, whether they looked optimistically into the future. And guess what? Over 70%, 70% said that they did. Big difference. So taking the view of the global south is instructive. It allows for what you might call the optimist view against the pessimist view as a, that I outlined before. And it is not difficult to adopt the optimistic view by way of a short hypoth hypothetical. If you had to choose one moment in history in which to be born, and you did not know in advance whether you were going to be male or female, which country you were coming from, what your status was, which time would you choose? You would choose today, at least according to me, because you would, in most places, be less likely to be living in poverty, less likely to be illiterate, less likely to confront intolerance and oppression, and less likely to die of disease or be killed in war than at any other time in human history. That's, that may be hard to imagine, given what we see in the news these days, but it's true. And a lot of that has to do with the achievements of the global rules-based order created after the Second World War. This progress that I'm talking about is something that we've crafted in the last 70 years. Quite an extraordinary feat. Much of this incredible story of progress, as I said, just happened in the past seven decades. With few exceptions, poverty has been reduced more in the last 50 years than in the previous 500 years. Data by the IMF show that the average Chinese person is 10 times richer today than he or she was five decades ago and lives for 25 years longer. Meanwhile, you would have to go back hundreds of years to find a similar period of great power peace. According to data compiled by the Oxford economist Mark Groser, the number of people who have died as a result of war, civil war, and yes, terrorism, is down 50% this decade from the 1990s. It is down 75% from the preceding five decades, the decades of the Cold War. And it is down 99% from the decade before that, which is World War II. This is a remarkable achievement. Reca recall the famous analysis by Thucydides about the Peloponnesian War. He said, what made war inevitable 
was the growth of Athenian power and the fear this caused in Sparta. In recent decades, we have witnessed power shifts at least as dramatic as the growth of Athenian power relative to Sparta. But not only is war no longer inevitable today, it is illegal. What would have been an absurd notion to Thucydides is today enshrined in the UN Charter, the prohibition of the use of force by one state against another. And progress continues as we speak. I mentioned before how much harm we inflict on our planet in the span of just 60 minutes. But within that same hour, it is also true that the number of people who live on less than two, day, uh, two dollars a day actually goes down by 9,000 every hour. That every hour, 12,500 people gain access to clean drinking water around the world. So what are we meant to make of all this? You can paint a plausible picture of the world on the brink of collapse, but you can equally sketch up why we might, we might just be living in the best of times. I draw three insights from that conundrum. First, that the challenges we face are real, existential, and among the most dangerous we've ever faced. But nothing, not climate change, not technological disruption, not inequality, is independent of human action. We are the masters of our fate. Our actions matter a great deal. And this means, secondly, that we have the ability to resolve them. The point of the incredible stories of progress in our recent past is that we have reason to be optimistic. Not blind optimism, but hard-earned optimism rooted in very real progress. Third, any action must be global and universal. We simply cannot successfully deal with the, multiplic the multiplicity of challenges we face, either regionally, sequentially, or in isolation. And to do that, we need to reaffirm the global order and the institutions that underpin it, notably the United Nations, which remains the only neutral table where everyone can come together and find solutions. The problem, of course, is that geopolitically, the past couple of years have generally been seen as a breakdown of global collaboration. Tensions rose, conflicts deepened, and protectionism resurfaced. Some pundits have even declared the return of the Cold War a return with a vengeance, but with a difference. For the mechanisms and the safeguards to manage the risks of escalation that existed in the past Cold War today are seem fragile and porous and sometimes not even existent any longer. Which is all true, but again, only part of the story. Amidst the background noise of bellicose rhetoric, the 193 member states of the United Nations actually agreed on something truly groundbreaking two and a half years ago. They agreed on a number of new policy frameworks, including on the most ambitious development agenda in human history, called the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, or SDGs for sort. The 2030 Agenda is the logical, necessary, operational conclusion from the three insights I just outlined, human agency, optimism, and universality. The 2030 Agenda constitutes universal recognition that the challenges faced by any one of us may swiftly become crises faced by all. Carbon emissions know no boundaries. Distant conflicts lead to refugee flows. And weak healthcare systems in a remote island state can lead to worldwide pandemics. The 2030 Agenda grasps that these challenges cannot effectively be met by tinkering around the edges of economic, social, and political governance but requires a fundamental shift in the dominant development model in all of our countries. With 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or as I said, the SDGs for short, and 169 specific targets, we now have, as never before, a detailed global roadmap of what needs to be done. The goal addresses everything from ending poverty, goal one, and achieving gender equality, goal five, to decent work and equitable economic growth, goal 8, to the rule of law, goal 16. And they are anchored in three fundamental principles. The first is that they are indivisible and universal and interrelated. The second is that they will leave no one behind. And the third is that it is everyone's responsibility. 
achieving the goals would create a world that is comprehensively sustainable, socially fair, environmentally secure, economically prosperous, inclusive, and more predictable. This Agenda 2030 is clearly an ambitious plan, no question about it. But it is the only appropriate response to the scale of the challenges we face. It is our global roadmap. For it is, and this brings me back to the three terms I introduced at the beginning, the right response to tackle polarization, to manage disruption, and to leverage diffusion. Take polarization. The 2030 Agenda defines a set of goals that everyone can agree on and support. That sustenance is better than hunger. That literacy is better than illiteracy. That peace is better than war. That equal rights are better than bigotry and discrimination. Or consider my earlier point about diffusion. It is true that international relations in the 21st century may be more messy than in previous decades. I'm not sure about that, but let's just assume. But it also engenders opportunities. If you win, I lose calculations dominated the Cold War era international relations, these SDGs are the paradigm shift necessary for the new polycentric system that does away with zero-sum games. The new logic is simple and powerful. If the threats are existential, if power is dispersed, and challenges are global and interlinked, then we really are all then, then we really are all in this together, and no one wins unless everyone wins. And this agenda is driving a change of mindset, a new spirit of collaboration and partnerships that simply wasn't there before, and that is happening across the globe. And the United Nations is, of course, ready to be the convener, the conveyor, and the facilitator for these partnerships. But its success will depend on much more than the actions of the United Nations, or even of governments. It will depend on everyone's involvement, from businesses and civil society to everyone in this room. It has never been easier to get involved in our collective efforts to make the world a better place. It has also never been more necessary. This is not time for bystanders anymore. The future will depend on the commitment, the ingenuity, the curiosity, the abilities, the sense of common destiny, and the empowerment of every person on the planet. It will depend on you. It will depend very crucially on your determination and capacity for transformation and reform. For the years and decades to come, we'll test our civilization like no others. We, and particularly those of you who are much younger than I am, are the first generation that can end extreme poverty and the last generation that can curb climate change. Think about it. It's a pretty heavy responsibility. We face a stark choice. If we cling to an economic and social model that drives exclusion and environmental destruction, people will die. Opportunities will be missed. The seeds of division and future conflicts will be sown. And the full force of climate change becomes even more likely and ever more likely. Or we create another world, a world where open trade is more collaborative where financial systems are safer and more supportive of broad-based growth, where gains are distributed fairly, where the digital revolution benefits not just the fortunate few, but lifts the fate of the many, where companies care about all their stakeholders, not just their shareholders, and where they uphold their responsibility to society, not to the stock exchange. We have the means and the skills to create such a world, where we can only hope for success, for success if every single one of us contributes. That is, that is what will make or break our whole endeavor. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you for being here. We have time to um, take questions in Greek or English. <laughs> Yes. Shall we take take them as a, as they come? Okay. Shall we start with you then, please? Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank uh, 
Professor Petropoulos and of course the eminent speaker for this excellent speech. We feel accountable for what we have heard. Mr. Muller, my name is John Bikakis and I would like uh, to raise some short questions. In the 70s we had the North-South Gap, a predominant idea that uh, gave birth to many conflicts and problems around the world. We are feeling, we feel at stake with the globalization doctrine and especially the global security solution or the regional solutions. The disagreement between regionalism and globalization is still an eminent, a prominent issue in the global security field. My question is, we have many, many hotbeds around the world, terrorism, cyber threats, technology deficits, all these dangers, how can we cope with? How can we understand the, in the deep reasons and how many measures can we adopt to cope with this? We are on fast a conundrum, as you have already said, a difficult situation which is rising. Do you believe that the mechanism, the suppressive mechanism of United Nations is adequate enough to deal in a prominent and speedy way to suppress or to cope with all these situations? I can begin and can, I can take as an example the terrorism situation, conflicts around the world are behind terrorism motives for all these reasons you have mentioned. So we are at stake with many situations. Globalization, global security or regionalism? This is my central question to all this. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I'll answer this because it's uh, quite rich. Thank you. Um, well, as I mentioned, or maybe I didn't, but uh, you know, uh, your your question goes to the heart of, uh, of of the fact that we are in an interesting time in history, um, in terms of uh, how we govern ourselves and how we will be governing ourselves. The structures that um, were created 70 years ago, in a very different geopolitical reality, clearly are not doing the job, and we are in the process of changing them. They are being. We are in a in a transition phase where. Um, and that those very structures are under, undergoing some very deep uh, and broad uh, changes. The state as a centri the, 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 the central power in any decision making is no longer going to be the only actor at, around the decision making table. Um, there are others. Uh, that will be speeded up by a number of facts. One fact is demographic, for example. By 2050, 75% of all of us on this planet are going to be living in cities, which changes completely the way that we are going to take care of the needs of our citizens um, in, in all uh, aspects of our lives, whether it's agriculture, it's health, it's uh, education, etc. The role of, of, of mayors and the role of cities is growing and has grown tremendously over the past years, and it's growing more and more. The equivalent weakening of the state is also something that we are witnessing. In there, you will also see, you are also seeing a, a growing importance of uh, of regional organizations and regional arrangements. I think that uh, because of the the global nature of some of the very heavy problems that we're facing, some of the big existential problems I mentioned, climate change earlier, migration is another, health issues, everyone, corruption, uh, quite a few. Um, you are going to need some 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 uh, co co coordinating mechanisms. And there we are seeing the role of the regional organizations growing. Um, and um, um, so th we are, in, the, we are in, a, in a strange time in history, if you want now. We are between two chairs in terms of governance. Um, the old system is still there on the defensive, uh, asymmetrically so. In some places, uh, the, the state is still the predominant actor, and others it's less so. The new system with different actors is not um, yet structured. It's certainly not legitimized yet. Some people will ask them who voted for you, basically. 
but the fact is that we're changing and that that process is happening. Um, and But we are, as I said, between these two chairs and stuff happens when that is the situation. This is what we're living right now. It's not entirely clear how fast this will progress and how, but it's happening already. Um, if you look at some of the very um, specific issues like education or like health, particularly in the vaccination area, some of the most successful multi-stakeholder polycentric governance structures are there and have done some amazing stuff um, and have proven their, um, their, their validity in, in terms of implementation and impact. So we'll see how that goes, but this touches on another uh, part of your question, which is um, where do, is the UN in all this? And clearly the UN has to undergo some uh, very massive uh, reform, and we are working on this right now. Our new Secretary General has presented a number of reforms, both in the peace and security area, in the development area, and in the administrative area, to the member states. And they're discussing it now, and hopefully by the next couple of months we will know a little bit, have a clearer picture of what the, the traffic will bear, how much they will give us or how much they will agree. Um, but w whatever amount they agree, whether we get a green light or a yellow or a pink or whatever color light we get, um, the fact is that the train is out of the station and we are moving in the, in the process of, uh, of a reform that is incredibly needed. Geopolitically, we are seeing some very deep changes as well. Um, uh, the, 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 the role of the United States is being put in question, is changing. The role of China is very much being, is changing. The role of a whole series of mid-level powers is coming to the front um, as they grow in, uh, in economic uh, might. And the so-called BRICS are a good point in case. So um, the world is now kind of coming to grips with a very different kind of uh, equation in governance terms. Um, and I, my crystal ball is a little murky. I can't give you an answer of where it's going. All I can tell you is that it's happening. But I come back to what I said before. It's incumbent on every single one of us not to sit on our hands or sit back and watch it happening. We have to be part of the effort and we have to be part of making sure that whatever comes out as a new structure of governance is aimed at helping us and making our lives better and making sure that our children's lives and that the planet is livable for the next generations to come. Because if we just leave it to governments right now as they are structured and with the kind of leadership we are watching in many places, it's not going to happen. We have a serious responsibility, each one of us, to make sure that our planet is a better place and that the structures that govern it and that we, uh, that we give uh, our vote to um, is as, um, as effective as possible. Um, I just want to touch on a number of things here um, that you, you mentioned and remind you of some realities. Um, you mentioned some of the, 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 the challenges that we face, terrorism, uh, all of these things. Um, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that when, when we talk about the, um, the threats to our everyday life as we perceive them as citizens in our different parts of the world, there are very different realities that are at play. A survey that was made, I mentioned a survey about uh, the, uh, the young people in the north versus those in the south and where the, uh, the, the sense of a brighter future is more than double in the south than it is in the north. That is also true if you extrapolate from that in terms of what their sense of, of threats are. What are the major concerns? When you ask somebody uh, in our part of the world, terrorism is of course at the top of the list. Um, when you ask the same question to the same demographic in Africa, in Latin America or Asia, terrorism doesn't even make it to the 10 most uh, uh, problematic lists. So um, the world is diverse. Um, it's not a cookie cutter approach, neither in governance structures nor in terms of what the, 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 the priorities are that we need to grip, grapple with, which is why I come back again to these sustainable development goals, because they are so inclusive and so understandable to everybody. It doesn't matter where you come from, what age group you are, what demographic you are in, what kind of level of society you are, they make sense to everybody. And I can, I can tell you that I have never seen um, the level of appropriation and the readiness to work in a collaborative way across these different uh, uh, um, parts of society, whether it's the international structure, whether it's governments, um, whether it's the business community, whether it's NGOs, whether it's academic community, it's quite uh, extraordinary. Again, this is happening in, a, in, a, in an asymmetric way in some places more than others, but the fact is that it's happening very quickly and it's happening in a, in a depth and a breadth um, that I have never seen before. I'll give you an example that really made me um, a kind of mini epiphany, if you want, that showed me that uh, something was happening, that a mindset was happening. 
when um, one of my staff came to tell me that they had realized that the senior most officials of over 30 organizations, UN organizations, that are based in Geneva, where I work, were getting together once a week privately in the evening to discuss how they could leverage their individual expertise and knowledge of the different organizations they were heading into some a better collective implementation of these goals to make sure that we would have an impact. And then I will remind you, when, if you are still a skeptic, the, the, the originator of these sustainable development goals was something we called the Millennium Development Goals that were uh, in place for the first 15 years of this uh, century. The world cut extreme poverty in half in 15 years of the first part of the century. They cut, we cut um, child mortality in half. We increased primary education to an extent where it is now globally standing at close to a little over 90%. Extraordinary achievements, which just proves that it can be done. And I'm quite confident that we can eliminate poverty in the next 12 years if we want to. We have the expertise, we have the knowledge, we have the human capital, and more importantly, we have the financial capital to do it. It's going to be expensive, but the money is there. Not in governments, and again, this comes back to this collaborative effort. Most of the money that is going to um, be, and we're talking about trillions a year, to implement all of these goals in, a, in an effective way is going to become from a, a very new kinds of financing mechanisms, uh, which most of it coming from the private sector. Thank you very much, Sorry. Mr. Merle. Thank you, my pleasure. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, you better, you better manage this. Next question. Yes, and, and could you, yes, madam, and could you state your name, please? Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Stefania Aksidian and I work in the field of cultural policy and management. Uh, I would like to ask you to elaborate a bit about the goal number 17, if I remember correctly, which is the strategic alliances. And um, the UN has been based on a national representation. And as you mentioned, the diffusion of powers means that mayors from different regions may have more in common between them than the national level representation. For example, a mayor in Northern Greece may face similar challenges to someone in South Bulgaria or Western Turkey than the mayor of Crete, right? And similarly, Greece, um, when it comes to climate change, has more in common with the small island nations than with the central EU representation in Brussels or Germany. So I would like to ask you, what are the UN tools that local actors can use to uh, implement this 17th goal, which I think is the key mm -hmm. to, uh, to also achieve the rest of them. I agree with you. And we're doing a lot. Um, the, the word partnership is really the red thread throughout what we are, the way we're going to be working. We are not going to make it unless we operationalize that in a, in a, in a way that we have not seen before. The other um, sort of key word, um, and, and doesn't touch it immediately on what you said, but it's very much part of it, is prevention. We have to get a lot better at prevention across the board. And we have the knowledge, and we have the expertise to do it, um, and, but um, we haven't done it properly. And, um, and that is part of the, the package as well. So what is happening now um, uh, is these cre the creation of partnerships is accelerating at a, at a, at a rate that is quite, uh, quite uh, something to behold at times, um, particularly in the first instance between these uh, organizations, these international organizations, and the business community. Those were two different worlds that barely had the same language, and you needed some really knowledgeable people to do the translation. These SDGs have now become the translator in a way, again, that I haven't seen before. We now have multinationals coming to us to ask us how they can be part of this. Quite apart from the fact that over the past decades, two decades I would say or less, um, the, the business world has, de has realized that it needs to be sustainable. Out of self-preservation, because if you're not sustainable, you're going to close pretty soon. You will simply not survive as a business. It's a matter of money. Um, so we are facilitating this. Um, I have just been part of, just to give you an example, um, that touches on something you said. I've just been part and facilitated the creation of a new um, network of SDG cities, it's called, which are precisely what you were describing, where a city like Heidelberg, uh, together with Palo Alto in California, and Abidjan in Africa, and um, I can't remember all of them, but there are 25 of them right now, 
plus, by the way, five indigenous groups have gotten together as a first start to do precisely what you talked about, which is to exchange um, uh, experiences, to exchange best practices, and to, um, to, to learn from each other and to reinforce each other. And it's working very well. This is happening in many other areas as well. Um, and I come back to this notion of the neutral table that we were actually created to be in many ways at the very beginning, back in, in um, 72 years ago, um, where these conversations can take place in a much more easy way. Um, let me give you a more um, an example that touches every one of you, and perhaps, and will touch it more and more every day, which is how we're going to deal with the, who is going to manage the internet? Who is going to deal with cybersecurity? And who is going to make sure that artificial intelligence is used for our improvement of our lives and not just the controlling of our lives? How are we going to make sure that uh, the ethics and the governance structures are in place so that we are going to be the ones who create our future, not allowing the future to create us in, in a way? And that is, again, where the neutral table comes into place. We are having some really very interesting conversations with some of the leaders of um, the technological, um, the big te uh, mammoth technological organizations and companies in Silicon Valley who have woken up to the fact that they need to uh, get their act together on the, on the governance structure and on the ethical part. They're very good at the technical part, but they're really not good at all on the rest. And this is where there now is a new alliance, if you want, between Geneva and, uh, and, and um, Silicon Valley where we are helping them and working very much for that. The most famous aspect of that would be uh, the, the head of Microsoft who has offered, uh, who has su suggested that we should create uh, what he calls a digital Geneva Convention, which sets out the rules of the game and how we're going to be uh, dealing with that. It's incredibly important that we get it right and that we really hurry up because um, uh, it, it already runs our lives. Um, the fact is that the ethical element has been uh, lacking. Most of the stuff that we're looking at and talking about is in the private hands and is being developed in the private sphere um, with very little oversight and very little governance. So um, this is an urgent task that, uh, that we're, we're looking at. So we also are part of the change and we are trying to change um, as a structure, not just the UN Secretariat, but the whole family of UN organizations. More, many of the technical agencies are, are, are also on board. And more and more, um, particularly with this new Secretary General, he's making sure that all of these agencies, of which are more than 40, uh, with all their partners, um, all sing from the same sheet of paper. Um, so it's a work in progress, but uh, it's happening. My problem is that it's not happening fast enough because the, the change and the progress, or process rather, not clear that all of it is progress, is happening at such a, a, a speed that most organizations, and certainly most individuals, have a hard time to adapt fast enough to that change. And that adaptation needs also to happen collectively. If we're in it in, in, together in a group, it's a lot better to deal with, it's much easier to deal with than if we try to do it individually. And that is true for individuals as it is for countries. My name is Athanas Katski. This is a student from the University of Peloponnese. Uh, I have a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for your speech. Uh, I was thinking to raise a question about the uh, European Union and of the uh, United Nations about the two Greek soldiers that are being held illegal in Turkey, but I prefer to ask about Gaza. Uh, we saw some days ago a massacre, and it, not, it is not the first time. The Israel side claims that it protects their field, and of course we all know what the Palestinians want. So what is the role or the measures that the UN would take to prevent against such in incidents? Thank you very much. The implication of what you say is that we have a kind of a magic wand that um, solves these problems. We don't, unfortunately. Um, but you know, we, we, we obviously do our best, and the Secretary General has been very clear on this latest example, which, as you say, is not the last time. Um, that is completely, utterly unacceptable, that it is against the law, that there needs to be an investigation, that those who have taken these actions need to be brought to justice, as has happened in the past in some small examples, but uh, that this needs to be done, and that we need urgently to bring our world back into a rules-based, value-based um, um, reality, which is more and, more and more slipping away from our hands. Um, he is putting pressure where he can. He is, if you want, in a certain way, 
the UN in a, if you want to depict a, a positive image of it is more than the sum of its parts and the Secretary General is a moral voice that expresses that reality and he certainly is trying to use that to the extent that he can but there is also a very clear reality on the ground um, that is uh, has been exacerbated over the past uh, couple of months and couple of years where some of the actors that take these actions have are feeling empowered and uh, are think that in the current configuration of the, the political world we're in that it's uh, they can get away with some of these action, actions more than they would have been able to in the past I think that that is a very short-term um, way of looking at things that that the reality of what is happening will come back to haunt them at least I hope so and that some of these people including the leaders will be brought to justice um, but uh, to tell you, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we have um, a practical solution because we don't. All we can do is to, um, to, uh, to, to speak up and uh, all my colleagues who are involved in the, on the ground are doing so. Those that deal with the refugees from Palestine, the Palestinian refugees, those who are the political representatives on the ground, the Secretary General himself, anybody who, is, uh, who speaks about it and we are trying to push. Uh, like-minded countries to speak up in, 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 in concert and in unison more than they have. Um, but the, the geopolitical realities of today are very difficult waters to navigate in, I'm afraid. So I can't really give you much optimism right now. All that we can do is to keep, keep trying to, to make it right. Hello, thank you very much, Anna Stavrakopoulou. I would like to ask you, I'm educating artists, and I would like to ask you, how can the arts contribute to, um, to the coming of, uh, to, to making young people more conscious mm -hmm. of what needs to get done? Is there a use for the arts, and what, what, what's your opinion? My opinion is a resounding yes, absolutely. And there are more and more artists who are uh, coming on board on this. Uh, there's actually a very interesting initiative that was started by um, a lady in my own country, Denmark, called Art2030. And she has um, collected in quite an amazing way some of the biggest names, not some of the biggest names in art across the world to sustain and to work on the 2030 agenda and to make sure that through their art they pass a message on, uh, on, on, on all of the different things that I have mentioned now. If you look it up, uh, you will see it. Um, I'm um, myself using art as much as I can. Uh, we are doing something in, uh, at the UN in Geneva called uh, Cultural Diplomacy, um, where we are encouraging um, states to bring their culture to the building and have exhibits with uh, art, uh, paintings or sculpture or music or literature, poetry, etc., and which uh, is very much part of the daily life of, uh, of the building and is an important element um, in understanding the other. Uh, art is a, is, a, is a universal language that makes, that translates the knowledge of the other in a way that many other, music is the same, but part of art of course. And it's an incredibly important element in today's fragmented world. Um, and to put it in very simple terms, I was explaining to you before, but um, if I have to negotiate with somebody tomorrow, I'm going to have a very different image of that person if today I will have seen an exhibit of the, of the, of the, of the, of the culture uh, in his or her country and have listened to the music and have understood a bit the soul of that country. Um, my entry point to the conversation um, on whatever it is we negotiate is going to be richer, more nuanced, and therefore also better and help me make the right decisions better than um, in, in that conversation. So for us it's really important. Um, and I, I think that uh, at least I'm pushing it, but also other colleagues, but I'm, I'm getting more and more artists who are um, who, are, uh, who are understanding that and who want to be part of that. Um, so whatever you can do to encourage it, um, you have my vote. And by the way, if you want to bring artists to come on a field trip to the UN in Geneva, I will also be happy because then they can really find out um, and have a conversation about some of the, um, the, the sort of really important uh, um, elements of our daily lives that need to be addressed and that they may be, can, can be inspired by. Sure. A question. One more. Yes. Sir. Mm -hmm. Oh, there. Oh, we can take a few. Sure. 
Hi, yes, um, <clears throat> just following up on Ms. Anna's question, my name is John Triplett. What's the role of education in terms of cultural education? And as you mentioned, Thucydides. What's the role of Thucydides in the hmm. 2030 agenda? In other words, should they, would uh, Thucydides speak to someone in you know, Asia, Africa, somewhere else? And how should that be uh, distributed, uh, the, the global ideas of uh, education, in the arts especially? Well, I mean, education is absolutely crucial. Um, I'll come to the cultural aspect of education in a second. Um, one of my big problems is that most educational systems that we have on the planet today are educating our kids for yesterday, not for tomorrow. And that is a huge challenge um, that needs to be addressed and really fast. Um, I was talking about the number of jobs that we're going to be losing over the next couple of decades, if not less. We have to prepare our kids better for what is coming. And it's hard to do because we don't quite know what is coming, but it has to, it, we have to twist, uh, change it, and certainly reinforce the values um, and the norms and, the, and, the, and, and all the good things that we have managed to build up over the past 70 years. Um, th I think that is crucial. I don't know to what extent Thucydides is going to be relevant in Myanmar and Uganda, but every region has its sages, and every region has its, its, its traditions and its, uh, its, uh, its past that speaks to us and that has to be drawn in. And some of it can be used cross-regionally, no question about it. And that is part of the education as well. And I come back to what I said before about, uh, about the, artist, the, art, the, art, the art element in it, I think, particularly in a moment in, in history where it's very hard to predict what are the needs that we need to prepare our children for. Um, if we don't know what the kinds of jobs we're looking at, and we do know some of them, we also know that many of them, many jobs will be created, maybe even more jobs than are going to be eliminated through technology. Um, but so it's not just about you know knowing how to craft a blockchain or knowing how to, to code. It's also about making sure that the basis on which we're going to craft our societies in a very different structure um, that is going to be um, provoked by these technologies, that we have a very solid basis of values and, um, and of, um, of rules and of law. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty chaotic. Particularly, and I want to bring that element into it, because, again, of technology. There are 7.3 billion cell phones on the planet today. Half of those are smartphones and are increasingly in numbers. It means that every single person on this planet has access to every single piece of information on this planet. But more, and more importantly, everybody, every one of these persons has the way of expressing an opinion. Most of those opinions are based on a very narrow, self-centered view of the world. It's incredibly important to educate these 7.3 billion people and to make sure that they understand the larger context in which their lives are, 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 are evolving. Uh, if we don't, at least try, and that is through education, but certainly also through a recalibration of the way our media work in all their different manifestations, and they go hand in hand, uh, we are again going to end up in a fairly chaotic situation. So um, education is absolutely crucial right now, and education that makes sense, um, and where the cultural element um, and the culture element um, is, uh, is central as well, is important because it speaks directly to the values that we need to make sure that everybody kind of absorbs. Um, it's, a, it's a huge challenge, but it, I, I, it's very much part of what we need to do, I, in my mind. Yeah, there's one. There's some more there. Have yes, I, I have time. Okay. If you have time, I have right. time. We, yes, uh, Ambassador. There's a gentleman over there as well. Michael, καλώ ήρθε στην Αθήνα. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ελπίζω να έρχεσαι πιο συχνά. Και εγώ. Since uh, the formation offices have closed, as you know, the UN is absent in Greece. Mm. The 2030 agenda is virtually totally unknown. And uh, that's why I said I hope you come more often. The world is, your speech was brilliant, and I congratulate you, and I am very proud that we worked together for seven years. He was my boss. Uh, <laughs> you remember that uh, the Secretariat has uh, gave birth to many ideas. We 
still we have around. But in order to, to have uh, a decision uh, in the United Nations, you needed some countries to support our ideas and to promote them. And usually, we used to, to look at the Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, were the good countries, the progressive countries. And through them, we managed to have some things done. They were the forefront of progress. Now, we have virtually an absence of leaders. And we have nation states, and the leaders are very important, the political leaders. You talked about the civil society, and I remember I finished my speeches exactly like that. We, it's up to us and up to civil society to fill the gaps of what uh, we see around us. What happened with leadership right now? Because one of the titles of the speech today was leadership. Where are the political leaders around the world to push this agenda and to give some, uh, let's say, inspiration to the citizens and uh, to reach, uh, to give some uh, courage and uh, to materialize these things. What happened to Scandinavia? Is it the fact that the social democracy, the social democracy of Scandinavia has gone down these days and uh, uh, we have this crisis of this approach or is something else? Thank you. Well, let me um, answer the, uh, the question about where the leaders are. I personally believe that they are to be found in cities. In cities. The best leaders I have seen the last several years are all mayors. And this is why I was very much in, interested in, in supporting this initiative I just mentioned that has just been created. Um, of creating these uh, SDG cities because this is where all the innovation is happening. Seriously, it's, uh, you go to uh, Heidelberg and you see how they deal with migrants and refugees, you won't recognize what you reason, read in papers. Half the city has been rebuilt. It is completely carbon neutral. Every building, every shop, everything is carbon neutral in all of their new buildings. Um, the technology that they are putting into uh, to the city to help their citizens is uh, together with the help of their, their, their sister city now in Palo Alto where most of these uh, big technology firms are. So, I mean, there are plenty and plenty of examples um, that are happening. I think that um, this is where it's happening and this is where the trend is going. I have to say, and um, I'll probably be fired for saying so, but national leadership um, sucks. <laughs> it does. But it has to do with the fact that the best are no longer attracted to civil duty and to civic duty at that level. They either go and make money or they will go to where it's really exciting to be a political leader, and which is in the cities and in the regions. Um, and the same phenomenon is happening in our countries, um, in my region. Um, I have to be honest with you, I sometimes don't recognize my own country, um, particularly the way they have been treating refugees and migrants. Uh, this used to be liberal open door policies that uh, we were proud of, or I was proud of, no longer the case. Um, but this is a trend that uh, we see in many parts of the world um, and, um, and has to a large extent to do with um, diminished leadership because the, they have embraced the, uh, the xenophobic and racist uh, dialogue of, a min of minorities. It's in every country in Europe, it has been minorities until the leadership kind of embraced it and used it and pushed it. the populism. Um, and it could have been avoided to some extent. I remember when um, Mrs. Merkel opened her doors to 800,000, opened the doors of Germany. Um, a few of us uh, convinced the press in Germany to really start reporting on these facts, using facts and not using impressions or, and they did for about two or three weeks, completely different narrative. The fact that every migrant creates a new job, that it has an incredible impact on the GDP of the receiving countries, not to speak about the countries where they came from. I mean, you know, very verifiable, proven uh, uh, facts coming out of the World Bank and other reputable institutions. And it lasts about three weeks. Then we were back to the, uh, the populist language because uh, they were closed down or they were just, uh, 
So it's a it's a it's an uphill battle. Um, the um, the organizations, and, and this is where when I say that the UN, and I, maybe I didn't say it before, but I, I think in this kind of very fragmented uh, world we're in, a difficult world, um, where we have seen more and more people moving away from these norms and, and, and regulations and, and values, um, the uh, UN is more important than ever. So the leadership of that is more important than ever. And interestingly enough, I'll give you a couple of examples of what we've been doing. Um, if you take responsibility, and do stuff that you think is right, and then ask for forgiveness later in case they don't like it. It actually works. You just have to take initiatives and, uh, and get it to do. And on the SDGs, this is what we've done um, in my office, where we have created, uh, I've created a, a uh, something called, I call the SDG lab, which, is, which is, was a unit that is supposed to help everybody implement them and get to know it, get, share information, share best practices. It's been in, in, um, in place for a year now, and it's become an incredible success. It's been copied everywhere simply because I didn't ask anybody for permission. I did it and I got member states to pay for it. I didn't have any money. Uh, our budgets are being um, cut. Um, I think the most generous way I can describe the member states' attitude to our budget is slash and burn uh, the last 10 years. So um, we have to be imaginative and actually no money makes you imaginative. And uh, it's possible and they accept it if it works. If it doesn't work, you go back to the beach you came from. Yeah, there was a, I think there was a gentleman there. Can we take just one more? One or two? One last There's or two. two. There's two are, are there. you, I got you. Right, we, sir. Okay, yes. ambassador. ambassador Walter has. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. It was an excellent introduction to the uh, SDGs and the challenges today. Uh, I'll start from a um, point made by Mr. Musuris, namely uh, for the uh, interest for the politicians, how uh, their interest could be attracted on what the UN is doing today. Having myself oh. been an old hand, ball, uh, both an old UN hand as well as an EU hand, I uh, tended to, uh, I appreciated the work of both uh, organizations. I would appreciate uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more on some concrete, mm -hmm. practical programs, countries uh, like Denmark or Greece could benefit uh, from those SDGs, especially in the uh, organization and development field. I say that because, because people here in Greece uh, tend to uh, look almost exclusively at this time to the EU for a uh, obtaining support for uh, improving functioning of both uh, institutions and uh, development here, and tend to uh, forget the role the UN uh, can play in addition to that. My question comes down to uh, what is the added value the UN can bring over what programs emanating from the EU or other local and regional um, uh, organizations can uh, bring to that. Thank you. Well, it comes, that, it, it comes down to partnerships, and we are working very closely with them. Um, but let me just step back a moment and, and remind you, and I'll give you some statistics that will bring it home. Um, when, um, when these SDGs say leave no one behind, it means leave no one behind, not just somebody in the south, in some poor country. One statistic that really struck me was when I opened a paper the other day <coughs> in uh, Geneva, and saw that in Switzerland that we, most of us, actually consider being a pretty rich country. There are 800,000 people under the poverty line in Switzerland that need help. Um, so it's really everybody. And uh, that brings me to the question about how countries like Denmark and Greece uh, can be affected by that. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a matter of um, mindset change. It's a matter of how you, s you craft your policies. One of the, the things that are coming up in, uh, you know, we have now been in that unit I talked to you about. Um, we have const huge amounts of conversations with people from all over the place, governments, businesses, everybody. And there are trends, that themes that come up again and again to the surface as the, some of the most preoccupying of, for, of, of the two first ones. The first one is how are we going to finance it? 
we're looking, as I said, at trillions, and there are many new financing um, methods that are coming up. The second one is how do you craft what we call a whole of government approach, which means how are we going to break down the silos in governments? It's not just in the UN system or international organizations. How are we going to make sure that um, our whole government is on the same page and, uh, and, and, and look at this as a holistic program, that the Minister of Health doesn't just think of health, but thinks about how he or she is going to craft policies that actually have an impact and will draw from some of the other issues and the other ministries. And it's very interesting to see what's happening. I mean, there's many different kinds of models that are coming up. Um, one of the first ones was an interesting one, was South Korea, that gave the coordination of the implementation of this to the Minister of Finance. All of a sudden, the Minister of Finance had to think in a completely different way than he was before when he was starting to allocate the budget to the different ministries. He had to think in a kind of matrix way. So that started the ball rolling there. Um, Costa Rica. Costa Rica has done, uh, gone way beyond that. Costa Rica has actually signed a compact with the business community in the country, with the civil society in the country, with the academic community in the country, and to where there is some very clear benchmarks on who does what and how they work together in order to implement these goals in a collective way. And uh, there are many examples, but it's really a, a matter of completely thinking outside the box both in terms of how you look at the issues that you need to deal with and how you look at how you're going to deal with them and how you're going to structure your, 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 your governance, whether it's in the business community or whether it's in a government, uh, to deliver on these goals. And then how you're going to talk about it. It's incredibly important that the narrative changes, that people understand that this is a collective, integrated, collaborative effort, um, both in substance and in the way that we do it. So um, very specific issues on poverty, I don't need to speak about that in Greece, plenty of poverty being in here, an economy that hasn't taken off yet, or an economy that is taking off but is not really touching the individual citizens uh, to the extent that it ought to. Um, and there, there, there is plenty of inspiration of finding, um, also by citizens. When you look at some of the things that are happening, for example, on mitigating climate change across the world at the very, very local level, it's pretty amazing what people come up with. Uh, urban agriculture. Um, water, uh, uh, you know, uh, savings and cleaning away the plastic. There's millions of initiatives going on. It's just a matter of capturing them and then m m multiplying them. One of the things, I'll give you a very clear example of, um, of how we are helping. Um, and this goes to the heart of this collaborative effort. By a uh, coincidence, actually it happened here. I was in Crete last summer for a conference and I met a gentleman from Niger. He is, Niger is pretty like down, um, probably the second lowest at the development level in the world. Very poor country. This fellow was a special advisor to the president. And with the minister level, he'd been brought in from the uh, diaspora, very educated person. And they had looked at how they were going to leapfrog Niger's um, development level. Um, and they decided they were going to wire and put internet into 15,000 villages across the country because that would, in very short order, change access to health, access to education, access to trade, access to everything. The problem was they didn't quite know and had, didn't have the, 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 in spite of the country team of different organizations that, uh, that we had there, and they didn't have the money. So I told him, I invited him to Geneva, and I threw him into this ecosystem that we built there with over 200 actors that work every day on how to, in, in, to, uh, uh, to work together in the implementation of these goals. And then some miracles started happening. All of a sudden, organizations that nobody actually thought of before said, we can help. Financing came. And this program is now off and running. And, if, and I'm very interested in making sure that this is a success. Because if I can prove that in two or three years, we have actually changed the level of education and the level of economic uh, well-being of this country through a collaborative effort that cuts across organizations and across the world, then we will have a proof of concept. Of, uh, of what we're saying. It's very easy to say we have to work together. It's nice, you know, it's a nice thing to have. But it actually, we're, we're, we're proving it. And it's happening, uh, we, we're, we're helping country, we're helping in an Indian state. We're, they're changing their agriculture from a chemical-based agriculture to a completely green agriculture. And in the process, they've actually started earning more money and making more jobs and feeding their, their people in a more healthy way. We have a program with Argentina that came to us. One of my colleagues came from Argentina and said that Argentina unbeknownst, certainly to most of us in Geneva, had a huge teen pregnancy problem. No clue how to deal with it. I mean, massive. 
So again, we threw them into this ecosystem we have created, and all of a sudden, people started raising their hands and said, we can help you with that. People that nobody ever thought about even asking before. So it's this um, sort of integrating of our efforts that needs to happen, and it needs to happen at all the levels, um, also here in Greece. But we can talk more about it. Yes. One, one last, may, may we take your question? We, we'd like a student to, okay. to pose a question, yes. Should I rise up? Please. Yeah, thank you, okay. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your speech. We greatly appreciate it. My name is Savasto Likes, I'm a student, and apparently not aware of the attire of the event, but I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, so my question uh, has to do with the topic that you touched upon many times, and it's the one of internet and its connection with democracy and democratic processes. So do you see, within the notion of our information society, do you see uh, social media as uh, that, uh, that do you see that social media could comprise a, an image of thought, maybe in a delusion sense, or could we and should we hope for a globally well-functioning digital public sphere? Thank you. Good question, and obviously a very topical one today. Uh, we've seen uh, some of the negative sides of the social media, what it has enabled, and what the negative side of some of the artificial intelligence. I think that people are waking up to the fact that we need to regulate uh, the social media in a much smarter way than we have done today. Where everything was—it's the genius out of the box, of the out of the bottle, rather. Uh, you're not going to put it social media back there, but you certainly can uh, make sure that, um, first of all, your privacy is protected, but also that it's not used for uh, demagogic and uh, populist uh, discourses that. Uh, uh, lead people either astray or into terrorism or into things that they shouldn't be doing, as we see today very much. And um, this is mo very much part of what is happening now, the conversations that are happening now. I just came yesterday uh, from a conference on, um, um, a global conference on artificial intelligence. But the title was interesting because it was arti artificial intelligence for good. And how are we going to make sure that all of these technologies are going to improve your life and whenever you have children, their their lives, um, and not um, and and not by uh, by not dealing with it fast enough and well enough, allow it to really go into the dark side. Uh, we have enough of that through the dark web and uh, and uh, and through some of the um, the negative uses that uh, that uh, uh, the social media have been used to, particularly in elections and and and, and fingering that. So it's incredibly important that we deal with that. Uh, it's here to stay with us. It's part of our lives. Uh, it's certainly part of your life more than maybe it is of mine, but it's already um, too big a part of my life. Um, and we just need to, uh, to to figure out a way to collectively come to some agreements on how we're going to regulate that. It's very important. Not only how we're going to regulate it, but how... And it's one of the problems of, of the Internet, for example, which is diffuse. It doesn't belong to anybody, although some governments are trying to uh, have ownership of it. Um, but the fact is that it, it isn't, and it is, it, its strength is its openness and its cross-borderness, if you want. But how do you then ensure that bad behavior is sanctioned? Who's in charge? Who's the police? Quote, unquote. All of these problems are, are, are really very topical problems, very urgent problems to deal with, and there's lots of conversations happening on this. And clearly there's lots of points, there are very different points of view. Um, a Chinese government is going to have a different point of view than um, the American government, maybe. I don't know these days. Um, um, but, uh, you know, there's certain countries that are still believe in, uh, in free speech and uh, in the right of the individual for its, his or her privacy, and that needs to be upheld. So some of these values I was talking about before need to be centered, come front and center of, uh, of our debate on, on what is this happening. There's an awful lot of very smart people who are discussing it. Um, and I think the willingness is there. It's just that the the agendas are so different, whether they come, whether you come from the, 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 the commercial side or you come from the government side or the NGO side or the civil society side. It's going to be a difficult conversation, but it absolutely must happen. And it is happening. But again, it's a work in progress. So you have to be part of that, those voices. I'm serious about that, and particularly on that, because this is such an absolutely crucial and central element of how we're going to be living over the next decades, if, if, um, that we have to get it right.
Villa, I think we should close our, yeah. our evening. And, and I should like, on behalf of all of us, to thank you. We're, we're now uh, born again optimists, I think. <laughs> Your optimism has been um, contagious. And we're all leaders, right? We all want to become leaders in a, a very small way. As you said, this is, there's no room for bystanders. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, Mr. Lynn.